God does not tolerate you. God delights in you. God does not tolerate you. He delights in you. God enjoys being with you. Think about that for a minute. God enjoys being with you. Now, I want to see just how awake we are right now. Say that with me. God enjoys being with you. Okay, now I want you to turn to the person next to you. And I want you to tell them, God enjoys being with you. <clears throat> now think about that. Think about that. Let that thought just kind of sink in. What kind of thoughts came into your head? What kind of things did you entertain in your mind this morning? What kind of words came out of your mouth this morning? How did you interact with people as you went throughout your morning and came in before worship today? What about those that you, well, maybe avoided? And still, God enjoys being with you. God enjoys being with me. Jesus said to his disciples, those who had come to him by faith, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may, be, may also be where I am. He's gone ahead of us to prepare a place for us. And he will return. We don't know when, but it could be any moment. To take us to be with him forever. God enjoys being with you. Now, God has been committed to establishing an intimate, personal, day-by-day, 24-7 relationship with you and me. All of humankind since the beginning of time. After he created everything that is, as the crowning creative achievement of all that he created, he made a man and he made a woman. He made humankind. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So when he made that man, he had created everything and he said, all of it's good. The only thing that he said wasn't good, and ladies, I'm sure you'll echo this with me, was the man. Not that there was something wrong with the man, but what was wrong with him was he was alone. So we continue in Genesis. Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God who created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. He made men and women to complete one another and to rule as co-regents over his creation. He created marriage and he instituted relationship and he gave that first man and that first woman a worthwhile occupation. He gave them something to do. But he did not leave them alone to figure out things on, on their own. One of the most interesting passages in the book of Genesis tells us something about a relationship that God had with the first man and the first woman. And the, the sad thing is we we don't know anything about the conversations that happened, but we know that it was God's habit in the cool of the day to come and to walk with Adam and Eve and to talk with them. We're not privy to any of those conversations. Matter of fact, the only time we hear about this special 
relationship that God the creator had with his created beings are in Genesis 3 when he had to take it all away. Look at these words with me. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called to the man, Adam, where are you? Those three words reverberated throughout all of creation because never once had man been separated from God. It wasn't that God didn't know where he was. I think God spoke those words so that man would realize what he had done. That now this, this relationship that God had created them for, there was a barrier. As you read on in Genesis, you find that Adam and Eve, before this time, were naked and unashamed. And as soon as sin entered into the world, as soon as their rebellion against God conceived, they were naked and very ashamed and did what they could in their own strength to cover up their nakedness, something that God meant to be a blessing to them. And there was a separation that reverberated through all of creation. You see, he had planted man and woman at the top of his created order. And so when they rebelled, everything under them crumbled as well. But it didn't impact just the man and woman and their progeny. It impacted all of creation. Romans 8 says it this way, For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will, by the rebellious will, by the choice of the one who subjected it. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And the interesting thing is the enemy of our souls thought that he had won. He thought that he had taken something beautiful that God wanted and destroyed it. But even as God the Father was chasing his beloved child, children out of the garden, even as death and decay began to creep into all of creation, even as that was happening, God was implementing his plan to bring us back to the garden. God wants nothing more and nothing less than to have a relationship with you and me. And he went to great lengths to give us that relationship. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to trace through from the garden all the way through to where God gives you and me the opportunity to have a personal, intimate, vital, 24-7, day-by-day relationship with Him. And the thing I want you to consider is, first of all, do you have that sort of relationship with God? And if you do have that sort of relationship with God, are you enjoying it to the fullest? We are told that the, the first and greatest purpose of mankind is to, to love God and enjoy Him completely. But do you know, have you thought that God wants to enjoy you completely? And he's done some things to help us become the people that he wants us to be so that we can enjoy that sort of relationship with God the Father. Here's how he began to implement that plan of his in Genesis chapter 3. I will put enmity between you and the woman. I will do this, God said, knowing full well the sacrifice that it would cost. And between your offspring and hers... He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Moses caught a glimpse when he happened on a site that was beyond his experience with nature. Being a shepherd for a bunch of years at this point, 
he's wandering through this desert place with a bunch of bushes and things all throughout the whole area and it was not uncommon for him to see a bush catch fire so he saw a bush not uncommon it was on fire not something out of the ordinary completely but what was out of the ordinary was this bush was blazing with a flame that did not consume it Moses being the intellectual genius that he was said ah something different's going on here and so he put down his staff and he walked over there and he was about to get real close to it so he could study it. And this is what God said. When the Lord God saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He had an encounter with God, but he had to keep his distance. Nothing like the first man and the first woman who walked in the cool of the day. Instead, he's in the desert. And he's looking at a bush that would normally just go up like that. Something was completely different. God revealed himself to Moses and the people of Israel, but they had to keep their distance. They weren't allowed to just freely enjoy God's presence. On one occasion, Moses had been interacting with God and felt very close to God, and he said, God, show me your glory. I want to see you in your fullness. I'd really like to look at your face what he's trying to say and he says in reply you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live so think of the distance that has been traveled from intimate personal 24 7 day by day relationship with God in the garden to now you can't even look at my face and live but God was at work to bring his people back to himself. He put together an elaborate system of feasts and festivals and sacrifices that would enable people to come into the place of worship of God and, and, and catch a glimpse of God, but they could not get close. The reason we know they couldn't get close is because every year they had to make the same sacrifices. If one sacrifice would have, would have cured everything and caused the, the rift to go away, then, then it would have been done. But every year they had to go, and every year they had to sacrifice. And every year, the husband of the family and the boys that were in the family had to go and lay their hands on the head of that sacrificial lamb and watch as the priest slid its throat and as the blood flowed out, reminding them that there's there's some horrible things that have to happen to take care of the distance between you and God. So, God gave Moses very elaborate, detailed instructions on how to build what we would come to know as the tabernacle. It was the mobile worship center for the people of Israel as they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Now, this is an outlay of, of the tabernacle with uh, the top pulled away so you can kind of see. Now, there were lots of different things that happened inside here. And different people could be in, involved in part of that worship. There was a, uh, an area around the outside where all the people of Israel could be. There was an area even further outside of that where Gentiles, people like you and me, could go and worship God. We were further away. But the Jews, the Israelis, could be right up close. But only one person could go into this next slide, into the Holy of Holies, the place where God dwelt above the cherubim. And that priest could only go once a year to offer a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the people. Now, the tabernacle gave way to the temple, all part of God's plan. It was a permanent structure that Solomon was the first to build. Here's a, a, a reenactment of the temple itself and all the courtyards on the outside, all the different things that were there.
But let's zero in again on the one room, the Holy of Holies, the one place <clears throat> where God dwelt, where humankind could have access to God. But the only one that could have access to God was the high priest in only once a year after he had taken all his clothes off, washed himself from head to toe in a special way, put on linen garments and put on all of the garb of the high priest, made sacrifices for his own sin, and then he would go into the Holy of Holies. Now this was such a terrifying thing that history tells us that they sowed seeds and bells on the bottom fringe of his garment so that while he was moving around they could hear him move around because just in case God was displeased with this high priest and killed him they could use the rope they tied to his foot to pull him out they did not have free and clear access to God and then, in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 3, a profoundly disturbing thing happens. Ezekiel 9, well, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel tells us all about the rebellion of Israel and how they've turned their backs on God. And finally, God had had enough. In Ezekiel 9, 3, we read this. Now, the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim, from the Ark of the Covenant where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. And if you were to continue reading in Ezekiel, you could trace how the, the Spirit of God left completely the land of Israel. God's Spirit would speak through the prophets on occasion, but the temple would soon after be destroyed and the people expelled from the land because of their rebellion. Now catch this. Why were the first man and woman kicked out of God's presence? The rebellion. Why were the people of Israel kicked out of the place where God had given them, where his presence would dwell? And why had he already gone? Because of their rebellion. You see, sin will continue to separate us from God unless it is dealt with. And when the spirit was gone and the temple was gone, they had no place where they could have any sort of communion with God. And so, when the last word of the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament was written, up until the point where the first word of the, the, the New Testament, the, the first word probably in the Gospel of Matthew was written, there were 400 years that theologians call 400 years of silence. Because God wasn't speaking to his people. There was nothing happening through the prophets. There were no books being written. It was silent. Then Jesus came to the earth. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, John 1.14 says. Now catch this. Literally, the phrase made his dwelling among us would be better translated tabernacled among us. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Jesus became the place where mankind could meet with God. Total, free, complete access to God. Verse 18 of John 1 says this, No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who's at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus is the full and complete revelation of God's glorious presence on the earth. And as he was here on the earth, he did many, many wonderful miracles and some incredible teaching. But one of the themes that he continued to speak about over and over was the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God in the hearts and lives of his people. That's what the kingdom of God is. And he said things like, the kingdom of God is near. He was telling them, wait a minute, pay attention. 
God is coming near to you. The kingdom of God is near. And then he said, the kingdom of God will be taken away from some people and will be offered and given to other people. He says in Luke 18, 16, that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He's speaking of children. Children who'd come to him by faith and wanted to just climb on him. I think sometimes as adults, we don't understand that God wants to enjoy being with us. And we think we've got to dress a certain way and we've got to, we've got to stand a certain way and we've got to say thee and thou and those kinds of things because God won't understand us if we don't. He says that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It belongs to children who come to him by faith. It belongs to those of us who say, hey, you know what? I'm going to I'm, I'm going to just be with you, God. I want you to rule and reign in my life. And I will trust you. He said, John 3, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. What does that mean? A little bit later, he explains it some. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water. That's a human birth. And born of the Spirit. That is born again or born from above. Born through coming to him by faith and trusting him as your Lord and Savior. And then he says, and this was the most incredible statement for Jewish ears to hear. The kingdom of God is within you. He said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsel to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Catch this. The incredible, awesome God who Moses, who spoke to God face to face, could not even come close to to the burning bush to get access to him. The high priest could only go in once a year. That God is saying to the people of that time and to you and to me today that I'm coming near to you right now if you will simply accept me. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And listen to this, my father will love him and we will come and make our home with him or her. No longer is he completely separated behind a veil that only the priest gets to go to once a year. No longer he is available. Now, Paul blows both Jewish and Gentile mind when he says, when he's speaking of the local church, the gathering of believers like this one, and he says, don't you know that you, and that you there is plural, you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you. God's spirit lives in us. This church, this body of believers we as disciples of Jesus are his temple. We are his temple, the place where God's spirit dwells. But then Paul, Paul kind of pushes credulity and he says something that is just mind-blowing even more so. He gets real invasive. It's as if he's looking at you in the eyes and you and you, and you, and me. When he says in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your body, singular, is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, singular, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You are the temple of God. Now, just so you don't think I'm just kind of making this up 
and trying to draw connections between dots that don't really connect. The word temple that's used here is the same word that is used to speak of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, oh, not, not the tabernacle, excuse me, in the temple. It's the same word. That's the place where God dwells, remember? You are the place where God himself dwells. You are the place. Now that doesn't mean that you are God. Doesn't even mean that you have a little piece of God. It means you're human. But God has chosen to dwell in you because you came to him by faith. And when he comes to us, he changes us to become even more like himself. So just as the Holy Spirit tabernacled among us in Jesus, so he tabernacles among humankind in the bodies of his people. In the body gathered and as we disperse back into our daily lives. There was a theologian I was reading on this uh, named Donald Bloch, and he said, holiness is not a quantity we can measure, it's a pathway we can walk. In our pursuit of holiness, becoming more and more like Jesus, we surrender ourselves to the control of the Spirit in our lives so that he makes us into the person that God longs for us to be. 2 Corinthians 4.11 says, for we who are alive and are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. He enjoys being with us. And when we enjoy being with him, he makes us even more enjoyable to be with. So I want to kind of draw this to a close. And I want to challenge you with a few truths how we can become more enjoyable to be with God. We can become more enjoyable to be with God, first of all, when he makes us more like Jesus. Now, this is, this is a thought that I really hadn't thought of before. Uh, I have to give credit to, I don't remember who, I read somebody and they pointed this out. The Holy Spirit is called holy for a couple reasons. First, he's called holy because that is, is who God is. God is holy. You want to know the core of his character, it's holiness. But he's also called holy because another way to use the word holiness or holy is sanctify. Sanctify means to set apart. It means to, to make something uniquely your own. And God, through the Holy Spirit, makes you and me uniquely his own. He is our sanctifier. He sets us apart from the sinful practices of the world and makes us his own people. So Jesus says this, and I will ask the Father, he will give you another counsel to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. And that is why, so that he can sanctify us, to set us apart, to make us more like himself. He's called the spirit of truth because he sanctifies or makes us holy by enabling us to understand and apply the truth to our lives. But the counsel of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. The spirit of truth transforms us by the truth. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given to us. If we want to become more like him and we want to have a more enjoyable relationship with God, we can do that as we allow him to make us more like Jesus by being in the word, by letting the truth transform us from the inside out. Another way we become more enjoyable to be with is when we live under his control. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. The comparison there makes clear what he's talking about. When somebody's drunk, we say they're under the influence. When somebody's filled with the Spirit, it's clear they're under the influence. They're behaving in a way that they wouldn't normally behave. 
because they're listening to what the Spirit says and they're following the Spirit's direction. So we become even more enjoyable to be with when we are under the Spirit's control. Another way we become more enjoyable is when we reflect God's character. The fruit of the Spirit, Paul said, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. There's no reason to have laws if you are under the control of the Spirit because that is what's going to come out of you. You will be loving. You will be good. You will be kind. You will be patient. You'll be all those things that laws are meant to try to drag out of us. As we noticed in Romans 8 last week, only when we are living under the influence of the Holy Spirit can the righteous requirements of the law be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. It's only under the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that we are able not to sin. We don't have the strength in ourselves. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, Paul says, is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. We become more enjoyable to be with when he makes us more like Jesus. When we are under his control. When our lives reflect his character. And then these last two. Uh, these two just blow my mind. When there are offerings of worship and praise that come from his temple. And who's the temple? Who's the temple? We are. You are. I am. We become more enjoyable. God delights in us even more when we offer up offerings of worship and praise. Peter, I would encourage you to maybe take some time and look at Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. He draws this, this beautiful picture. But here's just a snippet of it. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. God is already pleased with you and me. He already enjoys being with us. But to make that enjoyment more profound, He loves it when His people worship and praise Him, not because He's insecure and needs for someone to bolster His ego, but because he knows that the fullness of joy is found in him. We can look everywhere else that we want to go and we will never find fullness of joy until our hearts are centered on him. There's one last way that it, we can be even more enjoyable to be with. When offerings of worship and praise come because of his temple. When they come from his temple, yes, but when they become because of his temple. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9. This service that you perform, whatever the service was in this particular case, they were giving finances to meet the needs of some, some folks who were in dire straits. But whatever the service is, whatever service God's people give, is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of this, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them with every and with everyone else. Christian rapper turned pastor, uh, Trip Lee, challenged us with this. He said the mature Christian doesn't ask, what can I do? Rather, the mature Christian asks, what can I do to glorify God? You see, that's what the temple was all about. It was to bring glory to God. It was to bring sacrifices and praise to God. It was to draw near to God, to have fellowship with God, to spend time with God. And when we, as, as his temple, when we fulfill that, 
when we bring glory to him then God is glorified and praised and honored and our lives are become more full of all that he has for us God enjoys being with you he has been the architect of an, of, of an elaborate journey to get back to you he doesn't see you and I just as who we are right now he sees us as who we will become and he has come to live in you and me so that we can become and enjoy the fullness of all that he has for us and the more time we invest in him the more like him we will become I think the challenge for us is to surrender to the Holy Spirit's control and enjoy being with God if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus and you think wow that is God of the universe wants to know me I want to encourage you to consider that to think about checking it out for yourself and seeing if it's true the contact card in front of you in the pew in front of you if you're interested in talking about that a little bit more just write, write your contact information down there and just write just some kind of description of what you're thinking and what, you're, what you'd like to know more about. But if you're here and, and you've got a relationship with Christ, you've already put your faith and trust in Him, <clears throat> and you're not enjoying the fullness of that, I want to encourage you to pray along with me that God this week will enable me to surrender myself more and more to the control of the Spirit and that He would give me the fullness of all that he wants for me let's pray together Jesus we we can't come into relationship with you without your help and we can't grow in that relationship without the spirit empowering our minds and hearts to understand your word thank you that you are the spirit of truth Holy Spirit and that you come to set us apart, to make us more like Christ. Thank you, Father, that you put this whole plan together at the very beginning when mankind turned away from you. Make us the people you want us to be. Thank you for letting us be your temple. May we bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite the ushers to come on forward. It's an opportunity for us to give back as God has given to us. If you have a prayer request or a need, or maybe you'd like to talk further about what we've been talking about today, grab that contact card in front of you, and, and we'll give you just a second or two to fill that out and drop it in the plate as it comes by. Let me pray and ask God to bless this offering. Thank you, Father, for the offering that you we are about to receive. Thank you for the resources that you entrust to us. Um, thank you that we are... Uh, have the opportunity to be wise stewards with those things. And we pray that you would enable us to, uh, to take the truth with the funds you give us to, out into the world to share with, with more people.